Hey everyone, this is lecture four for POS 273 International Relations, an online undergraduate course taught in the political science department at the University of Maine, and I'm the instructor Rob Glover. So today, um, after this introduction to uh, international relations as a field, the international system, and then talking about using theoretical perspectives to understand international relations, we're going to jump into the first of these conceptual frameworks uh, that we'll look at in this class, which is realism. So today we're going to talk about what are the basic assumptions of realism. Uh, we'll talk about a distinction between what's called structural realism and neoclassical realism. So two different variants of realism. They share many of the same assumptions. Um, but they arrive at different explanations of how international events occur. And then we're going to look at some applications. We're going to look at um, the two chapters from Sterling Foker's book, uh, so structural, a structural realist account, a neoclassical realist account of the war in Iraq. And then uh, we'll close with this um, little snippet uh, looking at Dresner's book, talking about zombie fiction in relation to realism. And um, how insights from real realism can help us understand zombie fiction, but really how zombie fiction um, can be used as a, a lens to think about international politics um, and to take it down to earth a little bit um, with something that's a little bit less real, um, thankfully. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll start with the basic assumptions of realism. I would say that there are about four um, that unite Anyone who is a realist in international relations, if you're using a realist framework to try to understand events that are happening in the world, these are the basic assumptions that you're operating with. So the first, and arguably the most important, is the assumption of anarchy. Um, and when we say anarchy, we don't mean chaos, we don't mean disorder, we don't mean uh, you know people in uh, black jackets listening to punk music. We mean the fact that there is no overarching power to enforce law and punish, punish transgressions at the international level. So at the domestic level, um, you know, if you're driving down the street and you decide you're no longer going to stop for stop signs, one, you're engaged in very risky behavior that's probably going to get people hurt, but two, there is a agreed upon set of enforcers that very quickly will spring into action and punish you for your transgression. Right. You'll get pulled over by the police. You'll end up in court. Um, you know, if you hit somebody and damage their car or hurt them, you're going to end up in uh, civil court, uh, potentially paying, uh, paying for the damages. Um, so there's a system in place to ensure that if you engage in some sort of action that the community as a whole uh, thinks is, is dangerous or inappropriate, you will be punished. There is no such actor in international relations. Right? We talk about international law, we talk about international organizations like the United Nations, and they perhaps have some ability to influence uh, events, but there's nothing that really approaches the level of justice, enforcement, executive power that we have at the domestic level. Right? So international relations in that sense in, is an anarchic realm, according to realists. If you have the power, if you have the capacity to do things uh, and you choose to do them, it's a very imperfect system uh, if you do something that the international community disagrees with by which you will be punished. The second major assumption is statism, uh, meaning that the states are key actors in global politics. We could think of a range of different actors. We could think of world leaders. We could think of multinational corporations, international organizations like the United Nations or the European Union. But at the end of the day, realists are going to look at global politics and say the real most important actors here are states, are you know, national governments, countries, representatives of those states. Um, and they're skeptical of the role of international organizations like the EU, like um, the United Nations. They think in general that those are tools that are used and controlled by powerful states. It's problematic to assume that they have any sort of power in and of themselves. They also think that this is a realm in which states are concerned with survival. Um, so states are acting to maintain the power that they have or potentially to increase their power in order to protect their national interest and ensure survival. States want to survive, they want to be free from foreign invasion, free from attack, free from threats to 
um, their borders and the individuals contained within those borders. And so states are actively working to ensure survival uh, and tr working to confront what they sometimes call existential threats. So existential threats could be um, terrorist organizations. It could be, uh, you know, nuclear armed powers that are adversaries, but states are, are really concerned about survival first and foremost. And it's a self-help system. This is the last major assumption. So absent this overarching power to enforce the way that actors are behaving, uh, alliances are imperfect, international organizations are, are imperfect, and so states really need to provide for themselves. You have to focus on what are your capacities, what power do you have, how can you increase it, how can you maintain it. And it's problematic to rely upon other states or to rely upon external organizations to provide for your protection in this anarchic international realm. So those are the four basic assumptions of realism. The implications of the realist worldview are pretty bleak. Um, in general, realists think that competition and outright conflict, it's part of, it's baked into the system. It is baked into international relations. Um, so it is inherent, it is natural in that setting, um, and probably will persist indefinitely in international politics. Um, they also generally think that these structural conditions of global politics lead to security dilemmas, uh, meaning that there is oftentimes unintended conflict driven by shifts in the relative balance of power. And, um, you know, practically you can think about this in terms of uh, a country um, perhaps sees another country which is increasing its power, uh, increasing its military capability, they become concerned by that, and as a result, they work to increase their power, their security capabilities, and these countries start to eye each other suspiciously, and you end up in this kind of spiral in which uh, two countries which never had any intention to go to war simply by shifts in power and capabilities end up on a road to war because of the overarching condition of distrust, of uncertainty, of anarchy that pervades the international system. So very, t very often we end up going down a path to conflict between uh, two countries and it, it, it isn't, you know, natural. It's not, you know, in, in, uh, it's not inevitable that these two countries will go to war, but it's these shifts in power in a structural way that condition that conflict. Um, in general, realists are going to think that leaders, representatives of states, cannot be too tightly bound by ethical constraints. Um, so if, you know, if there's uh, some moral question about the use of force or, uh, you know, how you're going to protect your country, um, you have to be pretty willing, pretty flexible to um, break some rules, to engage in some moral transgressions in order to, pr to protect your state. This is a worldview which looks back to folks like Machiavelli, Thomas Hobbes, who generally have a pretty bleak worldview and think that individuals in this setting have to do some pretty awful things in order to ensure survival and protection of the state. And um, this assumption has carried over into the contemporary uh, realist worldview. Um, but that's not to say that they are hawkish for the sake of being hawkish. Um, it, one of the core assumptions of the realist worldview is, is prudence in the use of force. So state power should not really be used to wage what are sometimes called moral crusades, right? Um, large, costly wars uh, for some, you know, uh, kind of moral purpose. Uh, states in general, according to realists, should strategically use their resources to maximize power and advance state interest. And that doesn't mean always going to war that oftentimes means looking at a situation in which some sort of intervention is desperately needed and saying, no, we're not going to go there because it's not important enough to our national interest. Um, so for instance, the United States in the 1990s, there was an unfolding genocide in Rwanda and under President Clinton, they simply said, you know, this is an African problem. We're not going to get involved. We had been involved in 
uh, Somalia with a, a disastrous outcome. So we're going to step back and not get involved here. And that kind of flows from the realist worldview. A different worldview would have said this is a moral obligation. This is a responsibility that the United States has as a world power to step in and stop this genocide. But a realist might look at that and say, actually, no, um, you know, this is something that uh, actually doesn't relate to our strategic interest. And uh, we shouldn't, you know, put our, our soldiers at risk and utilize our military capacity to try and address it. So prudence uh, can be a core implication of this realist worldview. Uh, there's some different varieties of realism, and we'll talk about two, but there are more than that. And in Sterling Foker's introductory chapter, uh, she goes through a number. She goes through offensive realism, defensive realism, uh, all of these different variants of realism. But I want to talk about two specifically. Uh, the first is structural realism. So structural realism really kind of draws from economics uh, in an effort to have this systematic, almost scientific understanding of international relations. Uh, structural realists argue that it is not human nature, but the structure of the international system that makes it conflictual. So it's not that human beings are bad and you know, like to engage in warfare and like to hurt other people. But the structure of the international system, this uncertainty, this uh, quest for survival, this power balancing that occurs, drives it to be a conflictual space. So in these structural conditions of uncertainty, of anarchy, the rational decision for states, the decision that makes sense from a rational point of view, is to act in order to maximize your power and maximize your capabilities. Certain configurations of power, in, in their view, are going to produce different results in terms of how states interact and the level of stability for the international system as a whole. Um, neoclassical realists, by contrast, um, they share these, this assumption that structural factors like anarchy and self-help, that matters in the international system. But they also say you can't ignore factors internal to the state, right? Um, so there's domestic and even individual level variables that are going to determine outcomes. So it's, it's not enough to say that here is the structure of power that exists in the global space. Here are the the uh, you know the the assumptions of anarchy and self-help that condition the system and therefore that will produce these outcomes they say you have to delve into the state and look at you know what are the domestic variables who's in power who are the key national uh, uh, security and foreign policy decision makers what is the relationship between uh, you know the the prime minister and, and the, the opposition party or the president and Congress, right? Um, how is the media covering this? What is public opinion saying about what a proper foreign policy for that state is going to be? So structural realists, um, sometimes they talk about structural realism uh, as this black box. They think of the state really as just kind of a, a billiard ball on a, a pool table that's bouncing against other states and you don't delve into like what is the billiard ball made of um, but neoclassical realists do want to delve into the internal dynamics of states in an effort to understand what are the domestic variables that might shape an outcome and those become very important to their explanations of outcomes in international politics um, polarity is something that you'll see mentioned and this came up actually in the um, chapters from Sterling Foker's book. Um, so I'm just going to run through polarity and, and what that is. Um, basically, all polarity refers to is the number of major powers in the international system at any given time. And we talk about three different types of polarity. One is unipolarity, um, which is one major power, right? And what that means for stability, um, just from the assumptions of the realist worldview, is that um, the international system is unstable. It's very rare that we see a unipolar system. Probably the only example that we have recently is um, after the Cold War, the position that the United States was in, in terms of its power in the international system, its relative military capability. Um, in most, by most estimations, people would say there was this brief period in which we had a unipolar system. And from the realist point of view, that's unstable because other countries see that. Even if they know and trust and have alliances with 
the major power, they're going to be freaked out by a country having that degree of power. And so they're going to kind of try to increase um, their power and to, they're going to try to balance. Um, so either increase their internal capabilities or create alliances with other countries in order to balance against that one major power. Um, the second system that we can talk about is bipolarity, in which you have two major powers. And in general, that is a stable system. Uh, the example that we can think of historically is the United States and the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. So from the 1950s up until at least the 1970s, the Soviet Union began to weaken um, by the 1980s. But you had two relatively evenly matched countries. Um, and as a result, the other countries within the international system simply aligned with one or the other. They didn't need the, the they didn't feel the need to uh, you know balance against those two major powers because they were balancing against one another. And though the period from the 1950s to the 1970s was a scary one, in that you had two nuclear armed adversaries facing each other down. Um, from the point of view of international relations relative to other periods in history, it was predictable. It was easy to understand. Alliance structures were relatively easy to understand. It was generally assumed, according to the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, that it was highly unlikely that the United States and the, the Soviet Union were going to engage in a full-scale nuclear war with one another. If that were to happen, it would be the result of some sort of um, you know, accident, some sort of uh, mistake uh, that, that had happened. But it wasn't part of the... Um, foreign policy of those states. They weren't talking about how to win a nuclear war against their adversary. They are talking about how to prevent it for most of that period. Uh, and then lastly, you have multipolarity, in which you have more than two major powers, right? So you might have three, four, five major powers that all have relatively similar levels of capabilities and power. Uh, the example historically that we use is what's called the Concert of Europe, in which you had a number of European powers balancing against one another uh, from the 19th century up until World War I. Uh, we might look at the period now and see it as one of uh, multipolarity. We could look at you know, a poll in the United States, um, a poll in China perhaps, a poll in Russia, uh, a European poll with the, the European Union, which increasingly is trying to kind of um, harmonize its foreign policy. Uh, and in general, these periods are extremely unstable, right? Because it's, um, it's an uncertain uh, uh, set of uh, alliances and relationships, and it's unclear um, kind of who is the major power and, and how do you balance against that major power. So for structural realists, the polarity of the international system, the number of major powers, is going to have significant effects on its overall character and level of stability. So a structural realist might look at the period right now and say the reason that everything is so chaotic and crazy in world politics is because we no longer have a system of bipolarity in which you know the alliance structures and the foreign policy and the decisions that you make are um, you know very easily understood and operate according to a very clear logic in order to balance power and have stability. Um, so polarity is going to be important in any explanation that stems from the realist worldview about what is happening in the international system. So um, a lot of that is covered in the uh, introductory chapter by Sterling Foker, these basic assumptions of realism. And then the two cases, uh, the two case studies of the Iraq war present two different variants of realism. And I think that's helpful in that uh, structural realism and neoclassical realism, they share a lot in terms of assumptions, but where you really start to see the differences is when they're applying their theories and trying to explain uh, specific events. So as I said, in Sterling Foker's book, the, uh, the overarching kind of unifying element of the book is applying international relations theory uh, to the Iraq war, it started in 2003, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. with some international allies going into Iraq with the goal of disarming and removing from power Saddam Hussein. Uh, and the structural realist account and the neoclassical realist account give you very different explanations for why that happened. Okay, um, So I'm going to lay out just very broadly what the difference is here, and, but I encourage you, uh, once I 
I lay this out, if you haven't read those applications, to go in and really try to make sense of them. I know it's a challenging chapter, um, but try to make sense of, of how they, they differ. So from the structural realist perspective, um, their explanation is largely driven by these large structural elements of the international system. Right? This is what the international system looks like, and therefore we see these outcomes. So what sort of structural elements drive the decision to go to war in Iraq for the United States? Um, the first would be anarchy, right? uncertainty. Uh, Saddam Hussein had been engaged in all sorts of transgressions. He was not generally not trusted in the international system. He was viewed as a destabilizing force in the region. Um, and because he was the head of a state, there's really no system, um, no you know, international organizations or international law that can punish him in any meaningful way. Um, so these, the condition of anarchy means that it is up to states, it is up to individual states to take on that role. It is, there is no actor above the state that can take on that role. So from the point of view of the United States, if something is to be done about Saddam Hussein, then it is um, the obligation of individual states to take that up. This was also a period in which um, you had a tremendous power uh, relative capabilities in the United States compared to other states within the international system, right? Um, that would fade, right? Um, and, and now, as I said, we exist in a system that's it's harder to say that the United States is the lone superpower. Um, but leading up to 2001 and even until 2003, I think you could say that there's simply no country that uh, really was a match for the United States in terms of its capability. They also talk about um, the relative weakness of Iraq, right? They look at a number of different cases in which countries have gone to war, and they say it is very, very rare for a country to go to war with an evenly matched adversary. In general, the more powerful state uh, will, will pick on the less powerful state. The state with more capabilities will attack the state with less capabilities. The big fish eat the little ones, right, in the ocean that is... The international system. Um, so Iraq, even though the Bush administration in the lead up to the Iraq war was talking about how terribly dangerous and terribly powerful Saddam Hussein was and how he was a threat to the entire region and the entire world, relative to the United States, he was a, he was a little fish. And um, the, the Iraqi military, the Iraqi government was not going to be able to fight an evenly matched war with the United States. Um, it was also uh, a case in which you had a nuclear-armed adversary going against an adversary that did not have nuclear weapons. There was some question about weapons of mass destruction um, that turned out not to be the case, right? There was no evidence of, of weapons of mass destruction that was uncovered in Iraq. Um, but it was not a case in which Iraq had nuclear weapons. We knew they had nuclear weapons, and that very much would have changed the calculus in going to war. It's very, very rare for a um, country, even a country that has nuclear weapons, to go to war and attack a country that does not have uh, that, that also has nuclear weapons. Right. Um, so Iraq's lack of nuclear weapons, maybe the fear that they might develop them was um, was a, a structural factor here. So they look at these different structural factors. Um, they're looking at the, the relative power of the United States. They're saying it's really interesting that the United States is uh, right at the top of all of these different ways that we measure power. Uh, GDP, population, land size, uh, military capabilities, structure of the economy, all of these different ways in which the United States is one of the top five powers in the world, if not the top power. Um, but then you look at world oil reserves uh, and, and share of oil reserves uh, that a, a country has. And the United States is number 13. And so from the structural realist account, they're saying all these different ways that, um, you know, the, the structure determines given outcomes. Um, the United States as a major power, as probably the major power, simply couldn't tolerate a situation in which you had an actor making a region unstable that was such a key source of oil, given their dependence on foreign oil, right? given the fact that the United States just doesn't have the um, oil reserves that other powers in the world do. Um, so from the structural realist account, we get this kind of inevitable 
presentation of conflict, right? That the structure determines the way that individual actors are going to act in that situation. The neoclassical account is very different. As I said at the outset, neoclassical realists, they combine these basic assumptions of realism, but they're also interested in domestic factors. So they're interested in what is happening within a country that can potentially explain things. So all of the same things that structural realists are talking about, they think are relevant. Uh, anarchy, a unipolar system, relative levels of power, all of that is important. All of that is going to play a role in whether or not a country chooses to go to war or it doesn't. Um, but it's insufficient. That alone doesn't tell you why the United States went to war in Iraq in 2003. For them, the key factors driving the conflict were domestic. Um, specifically, what they talk about is the role of neoconservative policy elites. Um, now, neoconservatism, if you're not familiar with that term, that was really the driving force of the foreign policy of the, the Bush administration. In the lead up to um, the war in Iraq, in the aftermath of 9-11, you had a lot of folks that identified as neoconservatives. Um, it's a very aggressive foreign policy. Uh, it views the United, S United States as having a special role in the world. It favors democracy promotion. It favors um, very active measures to ensure that we have governments around the world that are going to cooperate with us on things like foreign policy initiatives, combating terrorism, um, building economic power. And so you had this, this group of neoconservative policy elites that had ended up in the Bush administration. And then you have 9-11, right? 9-11 leads to a war in Afghanistan. It leads to a global war on terror in which we're working with lots of countries around the world to pick up people that we think might be involved with terrorist activities. Um, and then uh, many of them ended up either in black sites globally uh, where they're being interrogated by uh, you know, local uh, intelligence officials and CIA officials, or they ended up in, in Guantanamo Bay where they're in US custody, um, but they're not technically within the United States proper. And so they're in this kind of legal gray area in which there's questions as to what rights they have uh, and how they ought to be treated. This is a period in which we were willing to use torture um, in order to, to prosecute a war on terror. So it's a pretty aggressive period in U.S. foreign policy. And all of these individuals um, within the administration are calling for the president to adopt this more aggressive posture. Um, you also have the domestic factors within the country after 9-11. So 9-11 really took the country by shock. People were fearful. Um, we pretty quickly ended up in a war in Afghanistan that um, was you know, geared towards ensuring that there would not be another terrorist attack. What, why we went to war in Afghanistan was the, the uh, willingness of the Taliban to kind of tolerate um, terrorist operations within their borders and provide them safe haven from the point of view of the Bush administration. Um, so you have an ongoing war. Uh, Congress, from that point of view, just given everything that is happening domestically, how freaked out people are about terrorism, uh, the fact that we are in an ongoing war, uh, Congress is, is in a very weak institutional position to challenge the executive branch and say, no, this is a bad idea. We're not going to go to war. There were a few who did, um, but in general, institutionally, Congress wasn't going to provide that check. And this is also a period in which the media is very reluctant to challenge, question, critically interrogate the things that the executive branch is doing. So for the, from the point of view of a neoclassical realist, those structural assumptions about the international system, they matter, but the key factors are domestic, right? You could have all of those things be true. But if you didn't have this constellation of domestic factors, what's going on within the country, you wouldn't have had um, a U.S. invasion of Iraq. So just note the, the somewhat subtle difference there. They share certain assumptions, but once they get into the key explanatory variables, that's where they diverge. And one is looking at um, systemic variables related to power, and the other is looking at domestic internal variables related to personalities institutional relationships, the relative power of different uh, branches of uh, the domestic government. And that's an important difference. That's, you know, where they diverge. All right. So turning to Dresner's piece. Um, so Dresner's chapter, the little section that I had you read, 
is talking about zombie fiction as a lens to consider IR realism, right? Um, and so he's talking about books like, um, uh, you know, World War Z and um, Night of the Living Dead, The Walking Dead, these different fictional elements that uh, have in their backdrop this zombie outbreak and some sort of internal security situation related to zombies. Um, and he uses this as a lens to consider IR realism and actually provides some of the same information about realism's basic assumptions that Jennifer Sterling Foker does. Um, and he says, okay, like how would, how would realism deal with a zombie outbreak? Um, and he says essentially that like the situation that one would encounter in a zombie outbreak within a country uh, is pretty similar to the situation that exists in international relations. Um, so one thing that happens when there's a zombie outbreak is anarchy reigns. Uh, you have this group of, of undead that uh, don't operate according to uh, any sort of larger system of expectations and are unfazed by this, the traditional system of punishments that you have to get people to behave in certain ways. Um, so from this point of view, they're almost like rogue states. They're almost like states that operate without any higher power. Um, and according to realists, what we see in fictional accounts of, of zombies is very much like we, what we see in international politics. There's a new, very fluid security threat, uh, and those with power and capabilities would be best poised to deal with a zombie threat, right? So those who have a communications infrastructure, uh, lots of capacity to inflict violence, uh, to you know, use force, would be well poised to deal with a zombie outbreak. Those that did not would face this existential threat and probably succumb to it, right? So small countries that didn't have very large military, that didn't have the infrastructure to, to deal with a zombie outbreak would collapse pretty quickly. And it's important to note that this is an existential threat, right? So zombie fiction is presenting us with a situation in which the normal order of things is broken down and societies, communities are faced with an existential threat, something that literally threatens their continued existence, which if you go back to um, the basic assumptions of realism is one of the core assumptions, uh, right, that states are focused on survival. Well, everyone in zombie fiction is focused on survival and preventing becoming one of the undead and trying to, to stop this outbreak. And so that's an existential threat, and it, that is a situation in which morality does not apply. Reliance on others is dangerous. So morality not applying, you know, if you've watched like The Walking Dead or any of these fictional shows that deal with zombie outbreaks, um, the way that they just disregard, uh, you know, these, these creatures is, can be really shocking, right? The extreme violence that they use to try to, um, to stop them or to kill them is really shocking. Um, but that's what the situation requires, right? It's an existential threat. If they don't use that level of violence, then they will succumb to the threat. So that's a good linkage in thinking about how realists view international relations. Um, it's also a system in which you have to be incredibly self-reliant, right? So in most of these zombie fiction scenarios, what you see is bands of individuals relying upon uh, one another in very small groups, but not with any expectation that the international community is going to step in, not with any expectation that the government is going to step in, but trying to do it themselves, essentially, or even individuals trying to do it themselves. And that, too, I think, models the sorts of self-help assumptions that we see in international relations from a realist point of view. Um, so be thinking about that, right? Be thinking about the ways in which even in popular culture or fiction, we see things that link up with international relations and, and can be used as, as a, a way to help understand something which can be very complex. Um, so we're going to wrap up with realism there. Uh, the next lecture is going to deal with liberalism, which is a very, very, very different perspective on international relations and how the world works. Uh, it is much less prone to view the world as conflictual. It is much less focused on the state as the primary actor. It has a much greater optimism that international organizations and international law can uh, produce outcomes that are less volatile and less unstable. 
And uh, in general, it's, it's a much more positive take on the world that sees possibility for cooperation, meaningful cooperation to develop over time. Um, so I want you to read the, the selections in Sterling Foker's third chapter, and also Dresner talks about um, liberalism in relation to zombie fiction. And as you do, think about how can realists and liberals look at these same sorts of situations in international politics and arrive at such radically different interpretations. So you're going to get a very different set of expl explanations for um, the Iraq war, right, from a liberal point of view. And why is that the case? Um, and which seems more compelling to you, right? Does the realist point of view seem like it makes more sense, uh, seem like it's a better description of the world, or does the liberal point of view? One very small caveat before we wrap up is that the way that we use liberalism in international relations and the way that we use the term liberal and, and liberalism in our general discourse about politics are very different, right? So it is not necessarily the case that if you are an IR liberal or you are adopting a liberal perspective in international relations, that you are left of center, that you are a Democrat, that you supported Obama or Hillary, like it is a really different thing. So don't be confused by that terminology. There are very conservative Republicans who identify as liberal uh, many looked at the Bush administration, for example, and their emphasis on democracy promotion as what we call liberal internationalism. So that is a very conservative administration that was operating with some liberal assumptions about international relations. So don't get hamstrung by that. If you're a Republican, don't think that you can't adopt a liberal perspective on international relations. If you're a Democrat, don't think that you have to adopt a liberal perspective because that's what aligns with your politics. It's a really different thing. Don't be confused by the terminology. So we'll wrap up there. Um, go off and do the reading for uh, uh, Sterling Foker and Dresner on liberalism. Uh, and then once you've done that, come back and uh, watch the, the second lecture on liberalism. Thanks very much.